There was recently an SSH vulnerability discovered in OpenSSH known as regression. And this one, very interesting. You can see on screen here, I have the article from Qualys. And this is one that um, the security world is, is going crazy about right now. This is one that you definitely want to be able to have a, a decent understanding of if you want to keep up with what's going on in cybersecurity. Now, the reason that this is gaining so much attention is that this is a very, at the surface, a very severe bug, right? It's an unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability in OpenSSH's server on glibc-based Linux system. So if I were to just translate that for you guys that aren't super technical, what it means is that you don't need to know a username, password, or anything like that from having no access to an SSH server, you can get full access on a Linux machine, full root access, which is the highest level account privilege that you can have in Linux pretty much. And this is something that's running on open SSH, which if you use a Linux server and you set up SSH, chances are it's going to be using open SSH. This is a very, very popular, um, software for SSH servers in Linux. Most of them are running OpenSSH. Now, the reason for it being called regression is actually the bug that is uh, at play here once existed, I believe back in 2006, someone found, uh, found this race condition vulnerability. They were not able to get RCE remote code execution off of it. They, I believe only were able to take it to a denial of service bug uh, and it was patched long ago, but in a commit that one of the developers made, so when I say commit, that means they made changes to the code of OpenSSH. They accidentally deleted the line that fixed that issue back from 2006. So this commit happened in 2020, I believe. And basically it re-exposed this old vulnerability that now researchers were able to take and use to turn it fully into remote code execution, RCE. So. That's why we're calling it a, a regression because a vulnerability that was once there and then was patched was reintroduced when a developer accidentally deleted some code that prevented it in the first place. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. If, you, if there's any questions on this, drop some comments down in the section below. Uh, but yeah, this is pretty bare bones article here by Qualys. It just kind of tells us at the surface level, what's going on. But, you know, if we want to level up in cybersecurity, right, if we want to get into the field, we want to start speaking the language, we want to dive a little bit deeper. We want to go that extra layer of technicality deeper. So we're going to do exactly that. And along with that, if you're on the path to becoming a cybersecurity professional, you want some guidance, send me a DM to my Instagram at Elevate Cyber, and we will get you on that path. Now, let's dive into this other article here by OpenWall. And... Um, you know it's a good security article when, when the text is so bare bones like this, when it, there is no fancy eye candy on the screen whatsoever, you know you're in for a good read. I definitely recommend you guys check out this article in depth. As you can see, based on this right sidebar here, this is super long, super in depth. So what I would recommend is uh, to, to check it out on your own as well. I'll provide the link to that in the description below. So for exploiting this based on the quality security advisory. Uh, these researchers basically are trying to exploit this on a number of versions. Cause if we go back here, we can see that these versions are affected. These versions of open SSH on um, various different operating systems. So they start off with a really old version of Debian back from 2005. And then they take it to a uh, 2006 version of Ubuntu. And now on our modern day, Debian server. Well, as of the time of this recording, not no longer modern because in the current version of Debian, they actually patched this vulnerability already. And I would imagine that um, a lot of the other distributions of Linux will follow suit. But here's the thing, people don't update their patches on day one, especially enterprise environments and stuff like that. So for a while, these, this vulnerability will be lurking out there uh, if history has told us anything. So yeah, let's dive into this. So one reason that this is so surprising that this is happening to SSH is it is often applauded for being super secure and a very good, well-coded implementation. And I mean, for the most part, that is true. It was just like an error by a developer that reintroduced this vulnerability that shouldn't have been there anymore in the first place. Like it says here, it's a, a little slip up, one slip up in a, in a near flawless implementation. But hey, guys, this is how cybersecurity goes. It doesn't matter how flawless you are. It only takes one misstep 
for the entire house of cards to come crumbling down. That is why defensive security is so difficult to do, to defend everything as the attacker. We just need to find one way in. So that goes to show you that, hey, cybersecurity is not going anywhere. If you, if you want to get into this field, there's always ample opportunity, and I don't think that's going to change. So as you can see here, and I, I read it somewhere, I don't see it here, but maybe it was in this article where it was the first vulnerability in like two decades that was reported in um, OpenSSH. Can't remember where I read that. I did read that somewhere though. But diving into a little bit more of the technical details here, right? They're going to test on these three systems. And as we scroll down, they'll kind of talk about their process and, and how everything went. Uh, so it is a race condition, okay? Now, let's just kind of chart that out. What is meant by the term race condition? So in a race condition, let's imagine that we have a number of resources here, right? Let's say that, let's say we have three here, just for random example's sake, right? This is the data that we're trying to modify here. And I'll try to make this as simplified as possible for you guys. And let's say this is, we'll call this A, we'll call this B, and we'll call this C, okay? So you have these three things here and they're all modifying this object or whatever. They're all modifying this piece of data here. Now the thing is, in a race condition, which is often the case in asynchronous code, code that um, does not run in any particular order. That's what we call asynchronous. There is no guarantee which one is going to modify this data first is the idea. That's why we call it a race condition. So I might run this program 10 times and out of those 10 runs get various results or various results at different times. So since this exploit relies on a race condition, it relies on something that is not completely in our control as the attacker. And it kind of varies based on which version of Linux you're exploiting with this, but we need to get the uh, the SIG handler to interrupt something typically. And what it does is it puts the heap in a uh, inconsistent state. So then you can then have like that primitive and you work off that primitive to basically get our shell code running and stuff like that. And the exact details on how to do that, like I said, it kind of differs depending on your target system. So as you guys can kind of see, even if you're not super technical, you it's probably floating around your head like, wow, this is kind of a complex vulnerability to exploit. And yes, that is the case. If we in fact look at, so this is called um, CVE 2024-6387. If we Google that for the CVSS, we can look at this tenable article here. And what we'll notice is that this is the CVSS vector. So if I just copy this, this is for CVSS 3.0. CVSS is basically a rating, a scoring system that will tell you how, uh, what is the rating of this vulnerability, right? In terms of impact and severity and all this stuff. So if I Google CVSS 3.0 calculator, I can go to the site here and I'm just gonna plug in some dummy values here. It doesn't matter. Just so it'll change my URL at the top. And what I'm gonna do is take this, and I'm gonna paste in that string from the Tenable site hit enter. And now I can see this is what it's rated. It's rated as a high with a CVSS scoring of 8.1. And this is why it's rated that. So you can see the attack complexity is high. This is what's really shifting it uh, in the direction. Like if this was low, this would be like almost the maximum amount. It would almost be like a 10. Now, the reason that it's a high, if I hover over this, and it's going to be probably pretty small on the screen, you can also look in the document of on this website. Uh, maybe in fact, that's what I should do. So if I go into the document, this is for the 4.0 specification, but it should be fairly similar here. If I scroll down to attack complexity and I read high, a successful attack depends on the evasion or circumvention of security enhancing techniques in place that would otherwise hinder the attack. Um, but also it should mention something not in your control as an attacker. 
So if I, I mean, when I, when I hover over this on 3.0, it says depends on conditions beyond the attacker's control. And this is really the main reason here, but also a little bit of this too, because on a modern system, you have to deal with things like DEP, um, ASLR, and all those modern security mitigations. But here it relies on that race condition. So that is something that is beyond your control as the hacker. And as you read through this article, what you'll find is that it took these researchers Actually, in all three of these cases where they tested these, it took them over 10,000 runs of the exploit in order to successfully hit that race condition and get their reverse shell. So it took forever. And um, that's, the, that's the key thing here. So if you just read this article and you're not a technical person, I mean, I'm not downplaying this vulnerability. It is severe for sure. But just reading this, it might seem like, oh, wow, like any script kitty is out there exploiting this right now in the wild. But the reality is this is going to take a lot of attempts. And funny enough, this is kind of counter to what you would normally see for the older operating systems here. It actually takes longer to exploit this vulnerability. And the reason for that is if we look here, it says that on the modern systems, on the modern open SSH server, the login grace time period is 120 seconds by default, but in the older OpenSSH versions, it's 600. So it actually makes a huge difference in terms of timing because if you have to run this thing on average 10,000 times to successfully trigger the race condition, uh, if you have to wait 600 seconds versus waiting 120 seconds, it's a huge difference. So what they ended up seeing is that on a modern system, you can trigger it. Now, on the modern system, you have to guess the glibc address, um, which will be randomized by ASLR. So it ended up taking them like six to eight hours to successfully exploit it in modern systems. But in the old systems, it took even longer, uh, even though there weren't all these mitigations because of the 600 second timer, it took them about a week or longer to successfully trigger this race condition and exploit it. But yeah, you can see the fine details here. I don't want to get too in the weeds with you guys here. I want to make this accessible for the majority of you guys. So this actually involves um, heap exploitation and um, memory corruption in order to trigger your payload in memory. Uh, basically, you're crafting a public key file that contains the exploit uh, from my understanding here. But this is one that uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are looking to optimize the exploitation of this. I'm not sure how much better they can do than 10,000 runs, but uh, it will be pretty interesting to see as the security researchers kind of pour their time into this even more, if they do. I mean, it is patched now, but like I said, most of these servers out there online probably have not updated yet. And especially in enterprise environments where they have patch cycles and things like that, and they can't just update on a whim, um, but they probably will make some exceptions here because this is a pretty severe vulnerability nonetheless. But if you want to get into the fine details, you can see it's talking about memory allocations and memory chunks and, and things like that. Uh, so yeah, I'll leave this one to you guys. So let me know if there's any questions on this in the comment section below. And, uh, yeah, if you want to get into some more cybersecurity stuff and, you know, I have plenty of videos on this channel, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.